So yeah, let's talk about code reviews. So first thing, what is a code review? Well, that's when you're working with a team and you're working on a common code base, you usually get the feature that you need to work on and then you code it out and then you want to contribute this code back to the main code base. So this is usually when a code review happens. And some people might think, hey, that's my code. I was working on it. I really put a lot of effort in it. It's, it's great. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want other people criticizing my code or looking at poking holes in my code and whatever? Well, turns out your code is not always that awesome. So sometimes you might be tired. You might be a junior developer. You might have uh, just a weird idea to solve, a weird way of solving things or whatever. It, it usually helps if someone else checks the code as well. So how will this benefit my team, you might ask? There's a bunch of benefits. So one thing, the first thing is uh, it creates a culture of openness. So people are not just hiding stuff and contributing it to the, to the repository. They're, they're showing their, the, the work they did to others. Uh, others are commenting. They're teaching them stuff. So cons consequently, this inc increases the code quality, which is a very important thing if you want to have your project for longer than just like uh, a month. Second, uh, the third part is that it catches a lot of bugs. So these are huge cost savings that I'm not going to go too much into details here, but it's, it's pretty valuable. Another one is team growth. So you have senior people that can look at the junior people's code. You, have, you can have junior people that look at senior people's code. So the whole, team's, the whole team just levels up. Another one, I think you're all familiar with the bus factor. So if someone gets hit by a bus, will the project still exist? So if you have more, more people reviewing each other's code, the bus factor is higher. So more people need to get hit by more buses <laughs> for the project to fail. Um, it also increases the code ownership. So if you code something out and push it, it's, it's your code. But if you, co if you code something out, push it, and someone else approves it and says, yeah, I really took a deep look into your code and I agree with it, then it's also a, bit, a little bit of their, their own code. So it increases the ownership. So do the cool kids use code review? So all the major companies? Yes. They, everybody, every self-respecting company usually does code reviews, some in a different way than the other, but that's a very standard practice. So why is this an art? Because humans. Um, since you have humans, then you have complexity, then you have weird behavior, and that's why it's a little bit of an art. So how to actually do a code review in practice? You have the main branch, so that's where usually when the main, the main functionality is. Then you take, one, you take another branch and create a feature on it. And then at some point, you want to contribute this back. And this is where the pull request actually, when the code review actually happens. It's called a pull request, and that's where people review the code usually. So that's the first step. How to open a good pull request? So this is an example of uh, not very good pull request. So the title is not very descriptive. It's just like, hey, bunch of features, bunch of fixes, yada, yada. And as you can see on the right there, it has a, quite a lot of changes. So I don't want to be the person who's reviewing this. Um, another thing is also there's, it also says it, no description provided. So good luck with finding out what this, uh, this is actually supposed, supposed to do. Also on the right side, there's no one actually assigned to it. Nothing is there. It just, it just sits there. This one's already merged, but this was an actual pull request at some point, thankfully a long time ago. Um, so how does a good pull request look like? First thing that it's a very important thing is uh, it gives context. It gives context to anyone who's looking at the pull request. So by having a nice title, with, which provides a good summary of the things that are being done. Uh, description tries to offer even more details. If there's anything that you can attach, like screenshots, videos, or whatever that might help the reviewer, you should add that to the description. And if, you have a, if you're working from an issue tracker, then of course you should include the link to the, issue, to the actual issue itself. It usually contains some specs or something that's useful. So the next thing that needs to happen is it needs to be reasonably small. So recommendation is that you don't exceed 200 lines of code. 
uh, in uh, one pull request, that's not always achievable, but that's a goal to strive for. It makes it much easier to review. So it usually, it, us it should have tests. That's pretty important and pretty self-explanatory. Uh, commit messages should be informative. That's a thing I'm gonna explain later. It should be focused on one thing. So let's say a general feature or just not like this feature and that feature and million of other changes. And someone should be assigned to it. So someone, so that goes along with the next line. Everybody involved should know exactly what's the next step on this PR. So if someone is assigned to it, then the assignee knows, okay, I should take a look at it. So this is an example of a slightly better pull request. The title has on the left side, so the start of the title is a link to our issue tracking system. So if you, if you follow that link, then you see the actual, the actual problem we were, we were working on. Um, then it offers a little more information. It has a bunch of uh, big description, so it, it says what it's trying to do. It also adds some more uh, info, which is a video. So a person can actually see what th what's this supposed to look like at the end. Um, also offers some, uh, some help if people want to test it out. And as you can see on the right side, it's reasonably small. So 100 lines of code, that should be easy peasy to, to review. It also has people assigned and also has the milestone. So people know where this is going and people know who's next to do anything on this one. Uh, if we look at the commit structure in a good pull request, that's also pretty important because you'll be finding these commits when you'll be digging through the code two years later. And if you structure it in something similar to this, it should be pretty useful to you. So a thing that every commit message so should stri strive to do is follow this, uh, continue this sentence. If merged, this commit will dot, dot, dot. So if we take the second commit, if merge, this commit will add Selenium tests for LHN state. Okay, that's, a, that's what's happening. Another thing, a good commit should do one thing. So a good rule of thumb here is if you have a commit message and you want to add the word and inside the commit message, it's probably doing too much stuff. So for example, add Selenium tests for LHN state and pull in Babel polyfield, blah, blah, blah. That's, that could be split up into two. Uh, third thing that is uh, nice to have is you can add additional explanation after the line break after, uh, in the commit message. So I've expanded the bottom one and it says refactor navigation bar model into base. Okay, that's the commit message. And then it offers some more explanation. Why? To make it consistent with side nav. So this is super helpful when you find this two years later and you don't know what was happening. Uh, so then we get to, this, to step two, the actual code review. It's mostly it mostly comprises of two parts. So you check the functionality and you check the code. I'm gonna start with checking the functionality. So you need to make sure that you have a clean state in your system. That is a very important thing because you might be chasing a bug or you might be, you might look, be looking at this pull request and you say this feature doesn't work, it's broken. But it turns out after like three hours of debugging that you actually had something, some file stuck in your system that changed, changed everything and uh, you just wasted three hours. Second very important thing that people sometimes miss is you should read all you can about the problem so you understand it, so you understand what it's trying to do. That sounds very simple, but doesn't happen. I mean, it's, it happens that people forget. Uh, if you're fixing a bug, so the third line, if you're fixing a bug, or if you're reviewing a bug fix, you should really try to actually verify that this bug still exists in your system. Because it, turns, it, it can turn out, it, it did turn out a few times, that some person was fixing a bug, but another person fixed this bug in the meantime, so this bug didn't even exist anymore. So this fix was just useless. So first thing you should do is try to actually reproduce the bug, see, okay, this exists, and then apply the fix, verify that the problem is actually fixed. If you're looking at the feature, check the specific specification, check that everything is working as it should, and then after all of this is done, you can try to break it. 
So you act a little bit as a QA. Um, you, should read, you might want to read a book on QA or ask a QA person to, to teach you stuff, like, hey, how do I break more things? But as a developer, you should have better knowledge of uh, what can you still break or what's, what might be the edge cases here. Second part is checking the actual code. So a prerequisite for this is that your company actually has some code conventions so that people know how the code, so how good code should look like. And if you don't have those conventions, there's companies like Google and Airbnb who, outs, uh, who open source their conventions and you can just use theirs. It's a very good start. Then you need to check a bunch of things like is it readable, do you understand it? Because if you don't understand it, you can ask for clarification. If, if the, even after the clarification you don't understand it, then there might be a problem with the code. Or it, maybe it's too smart, maybe it uses too much magic, it's, it's a red flag. Is it fast enough? That's just one thing. I mean, emphasis on the word enough. Um, did they follow best practices? Did you solve a similar problem? Can you find a better way to solve it? So generally try to help the person. Uh, try to find a different way you can do this or try to, try to make them improve the solution. So if there are some tests in the pull requests, uh, people usually, I mean, not always, but it can happen that people just say, okay, this pull request has tests, that's great. I don't need to look at it. But don't trust the tests. It's, it happened a few times that the tests didn't actually work. So what we did is we tried to remove, if it's a bug fix, we tried to remove the actual fix and rerun the tests, and all the tests actually passed. So the bug fix didn't, uh, the test didn't do anything. And the last thing that's important here is you need to be cognizant of how fast your tests actually are. So if this, this test will decrease the whole, I mean, will increase the time that your test suite runs by like 20 minutes, then it's a pretty bad test. You want, you want I won't go into too much details here, but you want to have fast tests to have very fast, fast feedback loops. So in general, when reviewing, you should definitely take it easy. Take your time. It's, it's not a race. Research shows that 200 lines or to 400 lines per, of code per hour usually makes for best results. It removes this amount of bugs. Um, with the comments, you should keep them short and to the point. So if you find yourself doing a lot of back and forth with the person, you're more, more likely polluting the whole, uh, the whole review with your comments, and you might just want to go to that person and talk to them. Uh, it's also OK if you don't find anything. So it's not necessary that you always find something that's broken or that can, should be improved. But the most important thing here is you should be friendly and helpful when giving feedback. So you're working with people. And it's very important to not hurt their feelings, not to uh, make, the make a bad atmosphere in your team. A huge thing that you can use is leverage tech. Leverage tech as much as possible. GitHub, we're using GitHub, um, and it's improved their uh, code reviewing functionality by quite a lot in like last year, I think. Um, you should also use code analysis tools. So you shouldn't go looking at where the commas are missing and where the conventions are wrong, you should just use tools for that. So I just wrote some examples for Python and JavaScript, but basically every, every language has uh, similar. So now I'm going to talk about some problems that we actually faced when we were doing code reviews. <clears throat> uh, one very common thing is when you start that no one actually has the time to review code. So you have a ton of open pull requests, and you need to release in two days. So OK, we're just going to review everything today and tomorrow, and we're just going to merge everything. And then you look at the first pull request and see, oh, it's completely broken. It, someone would need to work on it for like three days. Um, then you look at the second one. OK, this one is a little better, but we can't really merge it. OK, and you look at the third one, and you see, OK, this one is good. You merge it. 
And then all the other pull requests need to change their code because the underlying code has changed. So they need to work, they need to have, they need to do a little, even more work to, to be able to merge again. So everybody has merge conflicts then. And one thing people use, you can start thinking is, okay, I've done the task, I've opened the pull request, I'm basically done. Well, it's, it's not that simple. You're not done when the pull request is opened, you're done when your code is merged. So also a thing that happens is that management doesn't really take reviewing into account and it just says, okay, yeah, just this is, you have 10 days, so we'll give you 10 days of work. Um, our solutions, so we did a lot of talking in the team and a lot of uh, back and forth and iterations. And basically one thing we needed to do was talk to the management, said, okay, look, we need around 30% of our time for code reviewing. So you can just assign like seven days out of 10 of actual work. But then the next thing is code reviewing is also actual work because if you're not merging the code, then it doesn't work. Then it's, it's not in the system. The next thing we did, we started assigning reviewers to every pull request so everybody knew, okay, I need to review this. And the, thing, the, th the third thing, which was one of the biggest ones for us, was we made a rule. So every day you come to work, you sit down, and you f the first thing you do is you review pull, pull requests. So if you have pull requests that you need to review, you review those. If you have pull requests that you need to fix, you fix your own pull requests. And this is, so far, this is working very, very well for us, for us now. Uh, second common thing is that people basically become linters. So you just get a bunch of superficial reviews and people just expose like, yeah, instead of let you should use const. Yeah, instead of let you should use const. So we have automation for that. A thing we did is we, we tuned the settings of our linters a little bit. So you're not arguing with the person, you're just arguing with the machine, which is, uh, doesn't break the team spirit as much. <laughs> Uh, next up is uh, huge pull requests. So a person might want to cram everything into one pull request and then some poor reviewer will need to take a look at it. So we figured that this is around 30% uh, this of this is on management and around 70% of this is on the developer. And why? Because one thing we found out is if we convince the management to split up the tasks into nice small chunks, then automatically we get small pull requests out of it. If the tasks were huge and people were le relatively unexperienced and didn't break, the, break tasks down on their own, we got a huge pull request with uh, tons of changes that no one actually wanted to review. So a solution here is basically more upstream. So try to break down stuff into, into smaller chunks as soon as possible. And if that doesn't happen, try to do it on your own as a developer. Another thing is, so first problem we had was merging stuff too slow. Next problem is merging stuff too fast. So they don't review the code, they just click OK Merge. And a good, pro a good thing to do here is, uh, a good thing that GitHub has added here is you can lock down your branch. So you can require a pull request review before merging. You can require status checks to pass before merging. And this is how it looks in practice. So we have a bunch of automated checks and they're all required. If any one of those fails, except Selenium, which is experimental right now, um, then the, pull the merging is blocked. But the second thing is also a review is required. So at least one person needs to approve it before we can merge it. Another problem that commonly happens is pull requests get stale. So these two were open since December and I took the screenshot yesterday. Um, so the reviewer and the owner think they're both done. And usually that's because people don't uh, see the changes. So someone took a look at this pull request, it, he added some comments and the reviewer didn't see those comments and we have a problem. So no one's taking action on it and no one knows who actually should take action on it. So I think we're doing now is we're solving this with labels on GitHub. So if there's no label on it, then this means the reviewer should just review the pull request and probably merge it. 
if there are labels on it, like at test, it's up, it's up to the owner to fix the pull request. If uh, this review is super important, then you need to kick the reviewer to start working. Um, if, if there are some problems found, we add needs work on the pull request, so the owner knows, okay, this is a thing I need to fix. And all the other reviewers see, okay, the owner is probably working on it, and I'm not going to review it right now. I'm not going to lose my time if it's going to change anyway. So others are also the ones, the ones that we use, so on hold, question, wrong branch. Uh, those should be pretty self-explanatory. Another thing that can happen is that people don't accept feedback. So they take it personally. They get defensive. They say, oh, light was shining in my eyes. I couldn't code properly or whatever. Um, they think it's useless, it's a useless process or whatever. I don't really have a very good solution for this, but I think the best one here is just to talk as a team, uh, try to convince the people, I mean, try to show the value of this process, try to convince people why you're doing this. Maybe you can, you can have the people that are strongly against it to be the first reviewers or to just like review other people's code so their feelings don't get hurt, but like other people's feelings get hurt. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically here, this, the path to solving this problem is just a lot of communication and back and forth and iteration. So you usually don't, you, you, you're usually not able to solve those problems immediately, but in a few steps or in a few iterations, you usually want to look back like, hey, hey, was this a good solution? Was this a bad solution? And iterate on it. So I could go on, but there's, not much time left. Um, so yeah, to, to summarize or to one last thing is uh, when should I use code reviews? I would say whenever you have time or whenever you can because when you, when you start doing pull request reviews or code reviews, you'll get so much out of it that you'll improve your code, you'll improve yourself, you'll improve, improve your whole team. So especially if you're planning to keep the product for a longer time, so if, you're gonna, if you think this is going to be a successful project and you're going to work on it in a year's time. Um, but if you're alone and there's no one else that you could rely on, you could try to bribe a friend to look at your code for at least once a week or something and give you some feedback. And uh, that's all. Uh, so yeah, we're doing code reviews at Reciprocity, and we're hiring, so thank you. Yes? Um, how do we handle urgent bug fixes with protected branches? Because we, we started to use them, but we really uh, um, stopped after first Friday night uh, emergency. Um, it, try to fix the bugs with emergency. It gets a little complicated because depends on what kind of a product you have. So if you have a consumer product that people are using on Sundays and Saturdays, then you have a slightly bigger problem. You usually need two people available at that time. And we have a, kind of a product that's used mostly in companies. So we don't have those Friday night fixes as often, or at least they can wait until Monday. Uh, so the way to solve it is just try to have two people avail available and uh, at least, I mean, one thing we did is we had a convention before we, we added strict rules. We had a convention like, okay, if this and this and this and this happens and all the tests pass, then you can merge it, even if it's just you. So they need to be super careful. <laughs> <laughs>